Good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are all having a blessed day. So listen, yesterday I was out on my front porch early in the morning, me and Mr. Brody, and I was sitting there reading the Psalms 37 and then the book of Titus. And I had a great devotional. You know, it's one of those devotionals where God is speaking to you and a calm comes over you, a peace. You just have a great time. Well, you know what? Anytime that happens, you can bet that within 24 hours, the gates of hell are going to open up and all the demons are going to come at you and just try to destroy all your love, joy, and peace. And that's exactly what's happening to me. Yesterday was so awesome and today is just, man, I'm having a terrible day filming. I'm having trouble with my camera. I'm having trouble with my microphone, the lens, everything. This is probably the eighth or the ninth time that I've recorded these videos. But anyway, I'm not going to let them win. We're just going to keep on going until we get them recorded. And if I have any more camera trouble, I'll just have to get out the GoPro and we'll go with that. But listen, I want to talk to you about temptation and the way of escape. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, this is what Paul tells us. Therefore has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So Paul's telling us that every time a temptation comes on you, there is a way of escape. There's a door right there that you can go through and escape that temptation. So let's go into King David and let's take a look at the way of escape that he did not take and what it cost him. In 2 Samuel 11, and listen, when you're done with this video, go read 2 Samuel 11. It says, And it came to pass in the evening that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look at. So David couldn't sleep. He gets up in the middle of the night, walks out on his roof, and walks over to the edge and sees a woman taking a bath. And she's absolutely gorgeous. So right there is the first door of escape. David's tempted. He sees, he sees Bathsheba. All he had to do was say, man, she is gorgeous, and turn around and walk away. Turn around, walk away, go back to bed. He's tempted. He didn't do anything wrong. He walked out. He saw her. And, you know, it wasn't his fault he saw her. And it wasn't hers either. It's the middle of the night. No one's supposed to be out there. But he sees her. And he should have just turned around, walked the other way, went back to bed. That was his way of escape, that temptation. Easy to do. When you're tempted, the immediate instant you're tempted, that's when you walk away because that's when it's easiest to walk away. The more you sit there and stare, the harder it gets. So that was David's first door and he ignored it. And the next morning, what does he do? He gets his, some of his attendants out, some of his servants, probably runs them up on the roof and runs over to the edge and looks over the edge and says, hey, who lives there? Whose house is that? And they probably, well, well, that's Uriah's house and his wife Bathsheba. And so he says, well, go get her and bring her here. So David brings her into his palace and he has sex with her. Verse 5 says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. Right there, the second door of escape opens up for David. He sinned. He had sex with a married woman, and now she conceived. Totally sinned. At that moment, right then, David should have dropped to his knees and said, Heavenly Father, I messed up. Lord, I saw this beautiful woman, and it was more than I could bear, and I had sex with her, and now she's pregnant. Lord, would you please forgive me? and help me to get this all straightened out. Had he done that, of course he would have had those consequences now 
He didn't take the first door, now he's trying to take the second door, there's consequences. He's got to deal with Uriah. He's got to bring Uriah home, tell him what happened, and say, basically, name your price to, to pay him off. But he didn't do that. Instead, he said, I'm going to fix it myself. So he brings Uriah home, gets him drunk, two times sends him home to sleep with his wife, hoping that they can say, well, he got her pregnant. But Uriah was a, a very religious man, devout, and he wasn't about to sleep with his wife when his men were out in the field fighting a battle and risking their lives. So David said, all right, I'll take care of you. So he wrote a letter to his general, Joab, and said, put Uriah in the front and let him be killed. Verse 15 says, And he wrote a letter saying, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hottest battle, and then draw back from him, that he may be killed and die. So that was David's solution, instead of taking the second door and repenting. So now all that's done. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, murdered her husband, now when all that's done and he thinks, okay, everything's fine now, David's third door of repentance, third door of escape comes to him. He should have dropped to his knees and said, Heavenly Father, man, did I mess up. Lord, I committed adultery and then I tried to cover it up. I brought Uriah home. He wouldn't go for it, so I sent him back to the front lines to die and he died. I murdered an innocent man. Father, would you please forgive me? That was his final opportunity to escape that temptation. Would there have been consequences? <laughs> yes. But number one, God would have forgave him. If he repented on his own, God would have forgave him. He would have had the guilt his whole life of murdering Uriah, who was his friend and also a good man. And I'm sure that Bathsheba absolutely lost all respect for David. But he didn't do that. He ignored all three doors. Every time he had the first one when he could have just walked away and the second two times when he could have repented, he didn't do it. And you know the consequences increase with every door. Any time David could have repented, God would have forgiven him. 1 John 1 9, this is what it says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But David never did that. He never repented. So Uriah is dead. And then it says, And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. So David's going, Phew. man, that was close. I had adultery. She got pregnant. Her husband's dead. Huh. I got away with that one. Nope. The prophet Nathan comes to David and says, Listen, there's a man in your kingdom that's got a thousand lambs. And there's this other poor guy that's only got one. This rich guy with a thousand lambs, a friend of his came, and instead of slaughtering one of his own lambs, he went and took the one lamb from this one guy and slaughtered his lamb. And David gets furious and he says, Bring him here and I'll kill him. And Nathan said, You're the man. And Nathan exposed everything to David that he had done. David finally repents. Finally, but not until he's completely exposed. And Nathan tells him that he knows and God knows everything that he did. That's when he repents. And devastating consequences follow. Number one. The baby that him and Beth, Bathsheba conceived, that baby got sick and died. And then Nathan told him, everything that you did in secret is going to be done in wide open in your own house. 
And that's what happened. His son Absalom rebelled against him, and David had to flee. And then later on, one generation later, the next generation after Solomon, the kingdom was completely divided. The consequences got worse all along the way. People listen. Whenever there's anything in your life that God wants you to get rid of, when God reveals something in your life, people, places, things, repent. Repent. If you can't, if you've tried so hard you can't get rid of it, ask God for help. But go to God, tell Him what it is, repent, and ask Him to take it from you. People, listen. And I know this from personal experience. Never, ever, ever have God bring you to a place where you'll finally repent and get rid of it. You don't want to go there. It is far better if you go to God with the problem and get forgiven and have God help you with it than if God has to absolutely lay you flat on your back until you're willing to work with Him to get rid of it. You do not want to go there. Go to God yourself. Don't make God come to you. So listen, there's one more aspect of this story, and that is this. The baby. David was mourning for this baby. He did not want the baby to die. But the baby finally did die. And so then David washes his face, changes his clothes, and he goes out, and the servant said, Hey, man, you were mourning and everything, and now that the baby's died? You're fine. And David said, listen, one day I will go to the child, but the child will not return to me. And by that was David was saying that all children, when they die, they go to heaven. All children, when they die, go to heaven. Mothers, if you've ever miscarried, that baby's waiting for you in heaven. If you've ever had an abortion, that baby's waiting for you in heaven. So anyway, I hope all that makes sense. Heaven or hell, you choose. Just remember, once you take your last breath, it's a done deal.